it's so much complicated to move that. Uh, I do that here uh, in Atlanta, in the U.S., and uh, shockingly, things are wide open. Mm -hmm. We hope so. I guess we'll be starting in about a minute. Okay. I'm having Mr. Mahbubani called to see if he has trouble joining. Mr. Mahbubani Okay, let's start then. Uh, welcome to uh, Governance in We Trust uh, session. We have a wonderful group of people uh, who are quite knowledgeable in governance matters in, from different perspectives in our panel. We are lucky to have uh, such a, a great uh, list of people. And uh, we are going to discuss about uh, the governance from different perspectives uh, throughout the world, as well as throughout many different organizations. Human beings form institutions for two simple reasons. One of them is to manage risks better. The other one is to manage resources better. And uh, any type of institution, whether if it's a family, a country, an NGO, a company, I think all of them fall into this categorization. We form institutions only for this purpose. If the institutions have the trust of its stakeholders, they can deliver what they are set to do in a more economic fashion, which is basically the re re raison d'etre of founding those institutions. And the only way we can gain that trust is by good governance through transparency, accountability, responsibility, uh, consistency, and so forth. So today we are going to discuss about this trust. And the only person who doesn't need governance in his life is Robinson Crusoe. And that only until Friday comes to the island. Otherwise, we all need governance. So governance is not something related to only state or only corporate governance. It is about living together. It's a culture of living together, how we uh, help accomplish the goals of the institutions that we work with in a better fashion depends on good governance. So we are going to try to analyze this aspect from different perspectives. First, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Luca Jair, a uh, member of the board of the European Economic and Social Committee of the European Union. Mr. Jair, you have extensive experience in, with NGOs in dealing with global social problems such as immigration, integration, debt relief, voluntarism, participatory democracy. Could you please share us with your views on the role of participatory democracy in gaining trust and the difficulties of its implementation in a broad sense? Also, what should the role of the NGOs be in developing trust for good governance? So thank you so much and good morning, everybody. I am also delighted to be in such a high level panel discussing such a crucial issue of these days. Let me say first, uh, from a European point of view, that in the last two years, we have registered a very dynamic and, uh, and very reimbursing process that has changing uh, the, the rising skepticism of citizens towards institutions. This has been uh, demonstrated clearly also by the last EU barometer that are registering uh, the, the, the feeling of citizens on several subjects. The last one was done just the last autumn. And I think there has been two main processes in the last two years that have clearly changed this perspective. 
The first has been the EU election in May 2019, where for the first time after the first election of the European Parliament in 1979, there has been a, an enormous majority over the majority of, of 79 and a rising of participation, exceptional rising after 20 years of decreasing. And this has been done mostly by an increasing, a large increasing in participation in the vote by the youth. And that's a clear signal. There's been a reinversing of trust in institutions. And this has been followed a few months after when the new commission chaired by Ursula von der Leyen was, uh, has taken place with a very forward-looking program and also announcing a very shared goal that was the opening of a conference on the future of Europe involving civil society organization and citizen at large. And the second process has been after the pandemic raised, is uh, one year ago when, when we enter in this uh, nightmare, incredible world crisis, uh, and the, the capacity, the recognized capacity of EU institution with 27 member states, the fast and united response with the largest consensus ever from any part of society has been a second process. So I want to say that from this point of view, there has been a reinversing uh, attitude towards the, the institution. We can also say that uh, the, the state and their institution have raised a new role, a new accepted and demanded role. And of course, as the uh, ESC, the European Economic and Social Committee, that I chaired for two years until last October, that is the House of European Civil Society representing 350 members of uh, uh, enterprise, employers, trade unions, uh, environmental, NGO, uh, foundation, and other civil society, we have been quite in the, in the forefront of this process of reinversing. First, because this organization has been absolutely proactive in this change of the agenda that has led to this change in the European election, proposing instead of defending from the sovereignists to have a very proactive and new progressive agenda for the future. And second, because this organization has been largely recognized as having played a key role in facing and responding and providing solution and assistance during the pandemic. And this is the reason as today, the uh, exceptional and extraordinary financial instrument that has been put by the European institution in this new uh, recovery and resilience uh, facility that is enormous, uh, for facing the post-pandemic era, has put binding rules for involving civil society organization, meaning from employee organization to environmental one, in the designing and the implementation of this recovery and resilience uh, progress. Of course, and I conclude here, that this is a change of paradigm that can be lost very fast if we will go in, into a disaster in the vaccine campaign with all the bad signal that we had in the last week on the short uh, comings on, on, on delivering and so on. But this will need also to build up structured rules, procedure and institution for giving participatory democracy a stable, better and more structured uh, uh, direction. This is already provided in the Article 11 of the EU Treaty. We have realized in Europe at large some good experience the last years, uh, for example, on climate change and other issues in deliberative democracy. But now it's time to consider this way to give structure to this as a key instrument to reinforce and complement the parliament and to give a more stable involvement of this, this part of democracy, this society, organized civil society in building back our institution, taking stock of this reimbursement of skepticism toward trust towards institution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jai. Uh, so uh, participation through NGOs enriches the democracy, definitely. And you are working towards building them uh, more. Now, I'd like to turn to Augusto Lopez Claros, who has worked with the World Economic Forum in the past. and. 
He is the executive director of Global Governance Forum. Uh, last year, we commemorated the 75th anniversary of the UN Charter. And it has also raised a lot of questions about what kind of UN we need in the future uh, to confront multiple crises, some of them uh, posing existential threats for our future. Uh, what are some of the lessons that emerged from the pandemic that have a bearing on the future of global governance? And what is the role of UN in coming years in helping us strengthen our flawed mechanisms of international cooperation? Uh, thank you, Yosemar. Um, you know, the United Nations, as, as we all know, was created in 1945 to create a framework for, for peace and security and for prosperity. In fact, the UN Charter makes explicit reference to the need to promote social and economic development as a goal of the international community. In its 75 years, the United Nations has had many successes and, you know, some, some failures as well. On the successes, I would mention, for instance, um, the fact that it has managed in some fashion to avoid the uh, superpower conflict. Um, the Cold War did not end in uh, sort of a nuclear holocaust, not so far anyway. It was a very important uh, a catalyst in the decolonization process. Uh, the UN membership rose from 51 when it was created in 1945 to 193 now. And the UN played a very important role is, in ensuring that many of those former colonies join as sovereign states. Um, the UN was critical in improving the normative framework for human rights. Uh, following the UN declaration, uh, the declaration of human rights in 1948, in the succeeding decades, you know, we have developed a very solid international legal framework for, for human rights. The UN has been vital and has played an important role in peacekeeping and humanitarian aid. And today it's leading the way uh, through the sustainable development goals, which is a, a kind of a roadmap for, for economic development um, for the next decade or so. Of course, it has had its failures as well. Um, I don't need to go into the details, but I can only mention names. Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur. Um, you know, conflicts that have uh, completely violated the, the ethical uh, framework of the UN Charter and where the United Nations has basically been impotent because it, it doesn't have the instruments to actually, you know, deliver... Uh, for instance, decisions made by the by the so, by the Security Council. Uh, the latest crisis in Syria is again a, a, a reflection of the dysfunctionality of the Security Council, and I think it is uh, uh, an indication of you know some of the weaknesses that we see in the UN framework. The problem that we face today is that what is actually desirable in terms of reforms at the United Nations is not politically feasible. And what is politically feasible is not going to make any difference in terms of addressing our, our global problems, you know, beginning with climate change, poverty, inequality, and so on. So we are stuck in this, in this kind of dilemma. So since time is brief, let me just show in a couple of minutes, abstract from the issue of political feasibility and just mention what are some of the things that we would actually like to see over the next 25 years in terms of the development of the United Nations. Uh, you know, thinking about the first century of in, when we will celebrate the UN Charter in 2045. One area is that has been talked about recently is the establishment of a second chamber attached to the General Assembly. It's called the World Parliamentary Assembly. It's a mechanism to strengthen the democratic legitimacy of the United Nations. This is very, very important. At the moment, the General Assembly operates on the principle of one country, one vote, which makes no sense, has never made any sense. And there are people who argue, and I find myself among them, is that if you had a, a, a second chamber in an advisory role to the United Nations, made up of parliamentarians or maybe representatives of civil society, um, this would uh, add legitimacy to the UN system. That's one. Secondly, we need very much to improve the budget, uh, uh, the, sort of the finances of the United Nations. At the moment, it's a very chaotic system. 
and it has starved the United Nations of the resources that it needs to help us tackle climate change and you know the whole range of problems that we face in the world today. Um, you know, the, the European Union has its own sources of funding. Um, it, it does not uh, depend on the on the contributions of its members. You know, the funding of the European Union is actually uh, embedded in European law. A share of VAT contributions and import duties goes directly to the European Union budget. And this has given the European Union the ability to plan for the longer term and and to, you know, to play a very important role in um, sort of implementing good policies because it has the funding to support them. Uh, longer term, we need to do two things in the UN. We need to move to a different system of voting in the General Assembly, weighted voting, where the number of delegates in the General Assembly should have some kind of relation to GDP, to population size, to some other objective criteria. It cannot be the case that China with a population of 1.4 billion people, has the same voting power as Nauru, with a, a small island in the Pacific with a population of 12,000 people. It just makes no sense. And then, finally, um, the United Nations Charter has Article 43, which provides a framework for collective security, but it was never implemented. It's dead letter. It's there. It has established a legal framework for collective security, but n nothing has ever been done about it. We should think about creating an international peace force, um, an instrument which will actually empower the Security Council to do something when we are facing the next Rwanda or the next Syria or the next Darfur. At the moment, it doesn't have that instrument. And for that, its credibility has been greatly undermined. Thank you. Thank you, Augusto. Basically, you're suggesting we have to look into the decision-making mechanism and have a more fair representation there, as well as the improve the abilities of the institution to be able to deal with certain issues uh, through finances, uh, resources, whatever they may be. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn to uh, Judge uh, Jed Rakoff. Uh, he's a senior judge at United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. And he has a long career uh, following particularly abuses in white color crime. And I'd like to ask him uh, the following question. Trust takes a long time to build and it's very fragile. Furthermore, social trust for institutions gets eroded quickly when people find out about abuses of power, even in a few examples. Uh, with your experience, particularly focusing on white color crime, what are the measures we need to take to improve trust for organizations? So thank you very much. Um, people will not uh, have trust in the go their governments or their judges or in the operation of their laws if the laws are not applied equally. In the United States, I think the reality is that there's one law for the poor and a different law for the rich. Um, the That's not true on paper, of course. On paper, all laws apply equally to everyone. But if you look at the facts, here's what you find. If you are a poor person, particularly a poor person of color, and you break the law, you are imprisoned and under U.S. law since at least the 1970s, you are typically in prison for a long period of time. And the result is that over the last two decades, the United States, I'm sorry to say, has been the world leader in imprisonment. Um, two million people uh, each year. This is commonly called mass incarceration. 25% um, uh, of all the people uh, in prison in the world are in prison in the United States. It's a source, in my view, of great shame. Now, contrast that with the rich and particularly with high-level executives. And please don't misunderstand me. Um, uh, uh, in my experience, most high-level executives in the United States are very honest. It's one of the assets that we have. But 
um, the, there are those occasional miscreants. Um, and over the last 20 years, the government has ceased to prosecute them. And that was true under the Obama administration. It was true under the Trump administration. It's been true now for a long time. That was not true previous. Uh, back in the day when I was a prosecutor, um, people like uh, the CEOs of Enron and WorldCom were prosecuted and went to prison. But uh, uh, in the recent decades, no one about, among high level uh, executives have been prosecuted. In the case of the Great Recession, even though one government inquiry after another said that there was widespread fraud reaching to the highest levels, uh, no high level executive was prosecuted. Um, uh, there's a recent book by Professor John Coffey uh, of Columbia Law School called Under Enforcement. Um, in which he points out uh, an even more stark example, which is the case of uh, Purdue Pharma, uh, which uh, pled guilty, the company, to uh, overly aggressively promoting OxyContin, a very addictive painkiller, which led to the opiate addiction of hundreds of thousands of people and the deaths of tens of thousands of people and the um, uh, uh, while the company was uh, prosecuted um, the individuals at the top of the company were allowed to plead to low level misdemeanors that carry no penalty whatsoever so if you're talking about trust I think you need to have a much fairer application of criminal laws when it comes to the financial area. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Rakov. It's a very important subject. And when people see this uh, in their lives, trust for institutions really deteriorates. And once you do that, uh, the transaction cost increases everywhere. In a way, uh, lack of trust is like increasing the uh, friction coefficient. You get everything done with a much more costly manner. And uh, to be able to gain trust, what you are doing and uh, justice is extremely important uh, area. And we have to focus on that as well. Now I'd like to turn to Nicolas Rambus, an entrepreneur in residence at Detroit Venture Partners. We are going from governments to justice, now to value creation with uh, new entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We have discussed the importance of trust for improving our quality of life. One of the issues about the deterioration of trust is loss of control over what is an increasingly valuable and personal asset, one's own data. What would your recommendations be with respect to the measures that needs to be taken to improve trust for technology and uh, institutions who utilize these technologies. Great. So, so thanks for asking, and pleasure to be here this morning with everyone. Um, it, it's, an, it's a critical issue because I think part of the challenge and the recommendation is people's lack of awareness for just how little control they have over their information and how it's being used, right? So certainly in, in U.S. market and many other places globally, uh, you know, whether it's the big technology providers or people who are buying that data, if you haven't watched sort of the films or the documentaries, right, all of that data is being used to figure out how to more effectively market to us, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is uh, there's tons of personal information, personally identifiable information out there about all of us that unfortunately is increasingly used by bad actors, right? Fraudsters, thieves, and so forth uh, to target individuals, right? Whether that's been of late, that's the media, uh, for example, whether it's been the judiciary in some cases, there are lots of places where people sadly are getting their hands on the wrong kind of information. And so there's a there's an awareness and an education portion of this, just recognizing how bad it really is. So this education is the first step. Second step is having agency, right? People need to recognize that they there are steps that they can take to gain back control of their information, albeit limited with some of the rules and regulations we have in the U.S., but it's a start, right? And there are 
some tools today that people can use to figure out, right, what organizations know about them. Uh, but fundamentally, I'd say, and having had the benefit of living, you know, uh, outside the U.S. For, for several years in different jurisdictions, um, the expectation of uh, privacy is very different, right? Here in the U.S., one's home address is easily findable, right? Uh, one's voting records are easily findable. Those are things that in other places around the world you just wouldn't expect are easy for anyone to track down, right? And so as a result, we have identity fraud here, which is 2x as bad as it is anywhere else in the world. If you look at unemployment fraud last year, it was up 3,000%, right, year over year. Um, people are uh, going to town, so to speak, right, and using information against uh, other citizens. And so there's definitely a need for uh, and a role for government to play in restoring trust through some degree of laws, not to over legislate. Uh, but there are issues where, for the most part, the regime around thinking of one's data, the entire construct is based around a, a paper economy, right, where it used to be hard to go to a municipal house uh, or other records and get those hard copy, whereas now in the age of deep fakes, for example, now in the age of electronic records and AI that can crawl information, millions of records in seconds, there's there's very little cognizance around the laws that are uh, used or need to be in place to protect people. Um, so I would start looking at those laws as well. And then lastly, those laws are, are useless without enforcement, right, and active enforcement. And yes, uh, California, right, has uh, been proactive in this way in the U.S. Virginia became the second state in the U.S. to uh, put forth privacy laws, there's talk of federal legislation as well, but we're still a ways from where we need to be for really empowering citizens to be able to take back control of their information. But fundamentally, that's where we're headed, we hope, right, in the next decade or so, is consumers having real agency over their own information. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, it's a very important subject, and actually it is perhaps the definition of property rights, who owns what. Mm -hmm. And it has very significant impact. I will give you an example from my country. Istanbul is one of the oldest cities. However, we don't have that many very old buildings. Many European cities, which are much younger, have much more older uh, uh, properties and so forth. And all the older properties are public properties in Istanbul. And the reason for that is during the Ottoman times, uh, property was uh, owned or the control was with the Sultan. He could take over whatever he liked. So people didn't build durable uh, uh, infrastructures and so forth. So it has an impact on the socioeconomic and even historical uh, sites uh, throughout the world. And it has, a, as you suggested, the ownership of data about persons' own data has very significant impact on how we run businesses how we have democracy and so forth. Europe is uh, looking into this subject from different perspectives. And when, we, uh, when the first internet came through, we thought that it would really help participatory democracy by democratizing access to information. However, what we have seen was that availability information has increased so fast and so much that the limiting factor was not access to information, but rather attention time of the individuals and the ability to target individuals with their biases has actually increased. And rather than making a, a flat uh, playing ground, what it has done is burying everyone into, door, in, into their own wells of biases and uh, has started to even uh, hurt democracy rather than help democracy. EU is uh, quite active in terms of uh, regulating this environment, and particularly with the artificial intelligence right now, we need to make sure that uh, the new technologies such as artificial intelligence and so forth uh, are not uh, integrating human biases of the past into powerful technological tools. What does Europe doing in this area? And what are your uh, measures that you suggest, Luca? So, thank you so much. I cannot agree more of, of, on what uh, you are saying. And we have to, to take stock of the fact that uh, facing one of the major revolution, technological but also societal revolution, we have done all the possible mistakes uh, uh, to, to, to be done in, the, in, in this sense. Uh, for example, we have regulated uh, massively all the uh, issue of uh, against the creation of monopolies, but we have not uh, faced this issue 
of monopolies in control of the large platform and internet uh, by, by a long period. So I have nothing against uh, Bill Gates and all the others. Uh, by the GAFAs, uh, we have given to them the possibility to manage and to make their own rules, giving to them the control of all our data, where we have a lot of regulation in our member state, the European level, about the protection of data, and we are providing every day a lot of data on which we have no control, they're out of EU regulation. So <laughs> I think, and these are uh, the two areas on which the uh, European Union is concretely working. First of all, we have not to be naive, huh? uh, and we have to take stock of some uh, big phenomena that before coming uh, to the regulation of the devices, uh, give new division and new, <coughs> uh, how can I say, unfair condition for people. In Europe today, 40% of people have no basic skills to access to the digital era. 40%. And another data that we had experimented during this pandemic, where, for example, a large part uh, if not the large majority, 90% of the school university were obliged to go by remote. And now we discover, UNESCO was the first to deliver this in September, we discovered that around 30% of kids and students didn't have a proper and a fair access due to the technological division and difficulty of access to, to, to internet. Very simple, not to the artificial intelligence. So the end of the process will be that some have been capable to participate in the best uh, school at distance, but a part hadn't no access or no capacity to be integrated in this. So the European Union is taking this very serious and, for example, has established that 20% of all the recovery funds should be invested in the digital agenda. That means not only industrial and new uh, strategic autonomy in this sense, but also in providing uh, training and the capacitation of people, enterprise, without speaking about all these enormous tests on the smart working. There has been, there has been everything but not smart for the large part of, of people that has been obliged to go remote in work. The second issue that we need urgently to make a proper but fast reflection about new legal rules, new structure of enforcement, a new center for active vigilance, and also, if I have to say, counter propaganda. I use so much uh, during the European election this example. We all know the, the enormous uh, uh, value that during the Second World War has uh, uh, realized Radio Londres yeah. uh, and after Radio Free America. Radio Londres was to fight the Nazis and Radio Free America was to providing uh, a space of communication with the people on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So why we do not use, why we have not developed at our level some instrument adapted to the time of internet, of uh, all the instruments of communication, that we would have provided the same Radio Londres in this communication led by sovereignists in this respect. And so we need to organize in a very different way also the, uh, the uh, regulation on the online information. In all our countries, democratic one, we have found a proper balance between the responsibility and the freedom of press that concern journal, newspaper, radio, and television. But via internet, anyone can, can become journalists, can we spread communication all around the world using after the algorithm, uh, the, all the instruments that today can be used in, 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 in this respect. So we have to work on this and also to, to, to protect and to make known. But the last consideration is, is that one. We will not be able only by this to counterface the power of the womb that are using the force of the digital instrument of communication to pollute our democracy. Think to the role had by Bannon 
in polluting with Farage the exit of Brexit. Now is demonstrated this referendum was based by a joint action by Russia and Steve Bannon. The, uh, the role of this man with the Russian money in the French election and also in Italy, where they established the first school for training the new leaders in politics of the, the next decade in 2018. We need also concrete process. Look, and I will finish on this, to Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg has been an enormous force that became viral thanks to the, this instrument for the European election, but this started from a concrete action. Nothing could have become viral without an action of this young lady, of course. Her first appearance was in 2018 in Katowice, where she spoke in an empty room at midnight. Her video became viral, and so that's as the way the way to go. Organize Thank you very much. You have touched upon the uh, digital divide as well as the importance of regulation to protect our democracy in a very, with very good examples. Thank you, Jaya. Uh, I'd like to move to uh, Augusto with a different subject. It has been said that universal basic income proposals are unrealistic. They are both unaffordable and that uh, they may undermine the incentive for work. Has the case for universal uh, basic income strengthened as a result of the COVID-19? Would they contribute to a greater social cohesion and better protect us during the next pa pandemic? What do you think about this, Augusto? Um, Yilmaz, I recently wrote a blog, which you can find in my personal website, uh, titled, Let's Have an Honest Debate About Universal Basic Income. And let me just make two points, because we, we are uh, short of time. The first one is the whole question of affordability. A lot of the people who oppose the idea of universal basic income do so on the grounds that we couldn't afford it. It would be too expensive. And here, my main point is that... Uh, at the moment, there is massive misuse of resources in, in, in countries. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, we are subsidizing energy, um, according to a recent IMF study, uh, to the tune of $5.3 trillion. That's about 6.5% of GDP, which goes to subsidize uh, natural gas, electricity, carbon, gasoline, these subsidies accelerate climate change and they are regressive. They make income inequality worse because 60% of the benefits are concentrated on the top 20% of the population. Another IMF study says that the cost of bribery, corruption, right, is somewhere between one and a half and two trillion dollars per year. That's another 2% of GDP, right? So we're already up to eight and a half percent of GDP that is leaked out of the system which could not go to fund uh, uh, something like universal basic income. And then, of course, there is the whole issue of tax havens, where, again, the IMF estimates somewhere between $500, $600 billion uh, are a leak out of the, of the tax base uh, on the corporate side because of tax havens, right? So, so for me, the idea of uh, discussing universal basic income has to start from the basics. Uh, affordability is very important. We don't want to do something that, that is not sustainable. But then let's not, uh, let's not uh, uh, think that energy subsidies are sacred cows that cannot be touched. No, not at all. That's the one thing. The, the other issue is, you know, would, would uh, um, universal basic income undermine the incentive for work? You know, uh, the fact that people get a, a, a kind of a small safety net that is going to pull them out of extreme poverty is that going to turn everybody into uh, people watching, in, sitting in front of the television set, uh, drinking beer and watching sports and doing nothing else? And the evidence from the pilot studies that have been done is, is absolutely not. What universal basic income does in the pilot studies, it provides people with a certain sense of security. Um, you know, poverty is not just low income. Poverty is also stress. It's suffering. Poverty is very often associated with... Uh, a drug abuse, it's associated with domestic violence uh, because it brings with it, you know, a whole range of social dysfunctions. When you provide a safety net, um, it allows people to have greater self-confidence. It allows them to focus on the future, to, to, to see how they are going to use their small income to get a business started, to, 
to get uh, their education completed and so on. So, so my my it, sense it is convincing Augusto. <laughs> the resources are there. It doesn't uh, misuse the incentives, and uh, it helps the so, uh, social cohesion. I, I think you put forward very convincing arguments. I'd like to move to uh, Judge Rakov about uh, companies from time to time emphasize the public, how they are considering not just the shareholder value, but the public good or the stakeholders, uh, which is basically saying that they are internalizing the externalities in their decision making. Yet, uh, this does not seem to uh, provide sufficient trust for companies in the part of the public, at least in the United States. Why do you think is the case? So there's a very good book that came out a few months ago by Robert Putnam, who is a distinguished political scientist and sociologist at Harvard called The Upswing. And he attributes the decline in trust in the United States uh, to several factors. But the one that he thinks maybe is the most important factor is accelerating economic inequality, incoming inequality, wealth inequality, and the like. Um, and uh, when, uh, if you are a typical American, since the Great Recession, your income has remained more or less stagnant, except for the top 1%, uh, and they have become richer and richer. Uh, and it's very hard to um, uh, feel a great deal of trust uh, in that situation. Let me give you an example from the courts. Uh, after the Great Recession, there were a great many foreclosure uh, actions brought for people who could not pay their mortgages. And those were handled in the housing courts throughout the 50 states. Uh, in somewhere uh, between... Uh, 80 and 90 percent of those cases, the person who was being uh, sued uh, for non-payment and being told to be evicted could not even afford a lawyer. Um, and these were not all uh, desperately poor people, but they still lawyers fees had gotten so high again because they're primarily used by large corporations and the like that. Uh, these folks just couldn't afford a lawyer and they lost and they were evicted. And if any of you have ever witnessed an actual eviction where whole families are put out on the side of the street with all their belongings, it is a very painful uh, experience. By contrast, the 10 percent or so who did have lawyers were always able to work out a new payment schedule with the bank. Uh, so it made a huge difference. Uh, but it was only for those 10 percent. So this feeling of the world is divided into haves and haves nots, and then most of us are the have nots, uh, is a very, very great impediment to the development of uh, trust. Uh, in effect, uh, poor people are saying trust is a luxury that I cannot afford. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very personal and uh, very touching examples of uh, perhaps even supporting Augusto's case of universal basic income in a way as well. Uh, finally, I'd like to turn to uh, Mikolas uh, for the future. Uh, what would your recommendations be with respect to utilization of new technologies to build trust for governments, NGOs, corporations, and in particular international organizations because we have representatives from all of those institutions in the panel, and uh, you are the expert on technology. Could you give us, in a couple of minutes, a uh, few recommendations? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, and I'll actually just focus on one recommendation chiefly. So if we look back a little bit at history, right, uh, governments, NGOs, corporations, right, have, have and unfortunately had a track record of failing around a few core areas of technology. So I'd say, generally speaking, the group has failed around uh, infrastructure hacks, right? Information being stolen at mass. It, basically, everyone's subject. I used to be with Equifax, right? You're familiar with the big Equifax hack that happened, right? So unfortunately, these vehicles have failed in that regard. 
when we think about big data and our information being pulled up and hoovered up by Google, by Facebook, and so forth, we've as a collective in the last several years. So that's the past. Let's learn from that, right? Those are the examples. Fast forward five or 10 years from now, I could easily, even now, I could spend an hour going off of this call and create avatars, right? Sort of, you know, digital images of each of us that are representative, that look like us, that talk like us, that sound like us, but are actually a marionette, right? Controlled by someone in the back end saying different words, right? Deep fakes, if you will, right? The notion of identity is going to be the next big issue that governments face around trust. Whether that's this notion of synthetic IDs that criminals are so often using these days, taking pieces of a real person and putting that with a fake identity, or like I said, deep fakes, whether those are public figures or just your average person in the street and using that for, for bad purposes, right? The issue of identity is a major problem. Social security numbers, uh, as an example in the US, is a is an exceedingly aged technology to think about how we identify, provide services to citizens. So what I would say is the thing to think about for this collective is what is the nature of identity and the technology and solutions around guaranteeing identity in a modern world? I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Uh, I, th uh, I wish to thank all of our uh, panelists, particularly for the watching the time and uh, keeping it on time. Uh, but uh, more importantly, giving us uh, extremely important insights for the future. Not only reasons for lack of trust. We are seem to be learning from the failures of the past, but the future technologies and the focus areas require a lot of work. Uh, for us as well. And uh, the only way to build a better world and uh, improve quality of life would be to improve uh, governance. Uh, 